Center College in Danville in much of Kentucky was settled by Scots-Irish Presbyterians. Old Center, where I have the privilege of having my office, is a magical place for me. I don't think that the Norton Center would be around if it was going to be built today. A normal day for a woman living in the KCW buildings was like any center student. Class after class of very diverse, um, amazing young people coming to our community. That narrative starts with Jim Davis's enrollment at Center College. Posse has changed the culture of Center College. It's stunning, it's mind-boggling to see that footage. The C6HO story uh, is, is clearly a powerful signal on this campus. We knew that we were going to go out and we were going to play against uh, five or six five-star guys, if not more. The study abroad program has become a defining aspect of Center uh, relatively recently. It's exceptional, as far as I know, for an institution the size of Center to be awarded one of those debates, let alone two of those debates. Yeah, new buildings. <laughs> Where do I start? Jane Morton Norton, the, uh, the artist and writer and philanthropist who endowed the Norton Center, uh, commissioned a, a statue of Daniel Boone that still uh, is exhibited in the Norton Center. And she wanted him looking out at Sinking Spring. When the town was founded, it was founded around the spring and in particular, the Presbyterian Church was planted by David Rice on the hill above the spring. And since the college grows out of the church, I think the church's location really determined the college's location on the other side of the spring. It clearly was the reason that people settled here. You have to settle around water. The college uh, located here surely had something to do with its juxtaposition with the spring. The center was founded in 1819, but the story really goes back to the founding of Transylvania in 1780. And Transylvania was founded here in Danville by Father David Rice, who was the pastor of the Presbyterian Church. After a few years, Lexington was significantly bigger than Danville, so the college moved there. And the Presbyterian Church maintained a relationship with it, but there was always a tension between the Enlightenment types versus the church people. So several times, Transy cut its ties with the church, and the church, the Presbyterian Church, then started counter-institutions. Most great things start over a drink, and probably Center College started in the tavern. In Mrs. Davenport's tavern, which was downtown Danville, on the third floor, there was a meeting this was after the charter was granted by the state legislature. There was a meeting of about a dozen people, the likes of whom were Isaac Shelby, Dr. Ephraim McDowell, the surgeon, and they formed Center College in that tavern in uh, February, I believe, of 1819. It was a small band of people that decided there needed to be a college in the center of the state and thus our name. They're campus legends that were the geographic center of Kentucky and so that's why we got the name. It is geographic. On February 9th, 1819, just less than three weeks after Center's charter was granted by the state legislature, the legislature granted charters to three other colleges in Kentucky. Uh, one of them was the Southern College of Kentucky, which was to be in Bowling Green. Another one was the Western College of Kentucky, which was to be in Hopkinsville. And so this must have seemed to Kentuckians at, at the time a logical way to name the colleges. One in the center, one in the south, one in the west. Before the creation of the Federal Reserve, there were periodic panics, and there was no insurance, there was no backup for it. So in 1819, when the college was founded, um, there was a relatively minor financial panic, which meant it was hard to raise money. And so we really limped along through the 20s. Ten years after it opened in 1830, um, 
it was said that uh, Center College was without students, without reputation, and without endowment. So we were at a crucial moment in 1830 when we really had to have someone strong who could lead the college for a while, and we were blessed to find John C. Young. And he um, built up the college really from a struggling three or four students graduating a year institution to a solid one, which then survived the Civil War, which many, many of our uh, competitors did not. Center is un best understood as a centrist institution. We have not been an extremely progressive institution in the political sense, but we have also not been a reactionary institution as many other colleges have been. And I think that's an honorable heritage and fits with our identity. The things that we think about now of being Center College, the founders could have had no possible expectation that we would become what we have become. You know, we owe them a great debt. They, they did not imagine the institution that we now have in play, uh, that it would be recognized in the way that it is across this nation and the world as a premier place to receive an undergraduate education, but they would be immensely proud. O Old Center, where I have the privilege of having my office, is a magical place for me. You ask any Center alum, any longtime faculty member here, What's the face of Center College? It's got to be Old Center. People who know Center College, people who have attended Center College, when they see that image, they know exactly what it is. It represents Center College. Well, you know, Old Center has become the icon. It was uh, initially everything. The, the, um, as you walked in the door, on the left and the right were two rooms where the literary and debating societies met. Old Center uh, housed faculty, it housed students, it's where they ate, it's where they went to class, it's where uh, the first library was. Gradually, of course, uh, the college added buildings to the campus, but uh, even through the end of the 19th century, uh, Old Center was the main building on the campus. I love the fact that the original architects decided to uh, make a, a Doric feeling to it. You know, Doric as opposed to Ionic or Corinthian is solid and it's going to last forever. It's continuous, it's stable, it's strong. There's never a time I don't go through the front door that I don't stop for a moment or more often come out the front door and, and realize uh, Old Center's hallowed ground. Uh, everybody who has been a part of the Center College story, I think, has a part of his or her identity in that building. Um, and so for me, Old Center is a magical place to work. Uh, it is rich in history. Its impact in the American educational experience is profound, and it will become more so over time. The fact that we have retained it as a kind of a central place in the life of the institution that's not true at many places where you would go. The campus has moved, the campus uh, center has shifted. In the case of Center College, Old Center has remained both physically and I think symbolically as, as sort of the place where we started and the place where we still are. Now, what many people today don't know is that when Old Center opened up, it didn't look much like it looks today. There was no front portico, uh, no columns. Um, there were no wings. Where the current president's office is and the current dean's office is, those ends of the building weren't there. It was just a two-story brick building, very plain, what we would call federal style of architecture today. The building has served Center in, in, in so many different ways, as a classroom, as laboratories, as a, a residence hall. It was called the Center Home at one point. During the Civil War, of course, uh, most people know this, but they don't think a lot about what it means. It was commandeered by the Confederate Army as a hospital, a surgery, and then by the Union Army. I look at it kind of as an incubator as well. You know, a lot of other institutions started at All Center. EKU started at All Center. The Presbyterian Seminary started at All Center. Uh, the law school at U of L started at Old Center, and so in the past almost 200 years now, it, it's given birth to not only 
Center College, but lots of offshoots. When I think about Old Center, I'm not many days thinking about the history that was made in the past there. I'm thinking about the history that we are making now. One of the things that's been unearthed as part of Center College's preparations for Bicentennial is what must be the earliest uh, known movie footage of Center College campus and students. To find this, this earliest known footage is truly remarkable. The film footage that we found, it makes sense to me that it's a fraternity doing it. This are, are some of the featured scenes in the first part of that movie uh, appear to be taken at the uh, Phi Kappa Ta House, which was at 359 South 4th Street in Danville in 1930. Just the, the shots of students um, fooling around and laughing, uh, the one young man drinking Gordon's gin, uh, and the shotgun wedding. Shotgun wedding scene, um, I think, was a common fear of fraternity men who might be in a position to have pregnant girlfriends. Uh, in those days, if a, a KCW woman got pregnant, she would be sent home. Uh, they would say it very politely. Right. She might find it more convenient to ed be educated closer to her home. It's a great snapshot of jacking around by the students. Human behavior doesn't change very much. You, you pick up a movie camera or whatever the equivalent of it is now, uh, and people are going to do the same kind of foolishness in front of the camera now that they did a hundred years ago. To me it's quite moving because they are faces from long ago and they look like they could be on campus today other than the fact that their clothes are dated and maybe a couple of haircuts are dated. But it, it brings us faces from, from the past and they're right there in front of us and I, I just think that's wonderful. It's really quite moving. I was blown away when I saw um, very early on in the movie, they're suddenly up in a plane. And I think it's wonderful that you could see the strut of the airplane. It's shot from a biplane. So it looks like something from, from Hell's Angels, that old Howard uh, Hughes, Howard Hawks film. I had no idea that you could put a camera on those old things, those old machines that you know, barely got off the ground. Uh, probably the newest building in that set is Carnegie, which was 1913. You can see, for example, the, the uh, Old Main, Young Hall, the football stadium, and the repositioned football stadium that's 90 degrees away, uh, angled away from Old Main. You could see uh, Old Center. Get to see how small the trees were and how few of them there were. It's more like a field than it is today. Today we're used to it being a leafy campus. Well, it's stunning. It's stunning. It's mind-boggling to see that footage. I think that film of the co-ed graduation ceremony must have been the first one. When I saw that film, it just made me feel really happy and excited and to think back on those days and remember that we had a lot of wonderful years here at Center. Some things change and some things don't. We still have that graduation professions, uh, procession starting from Old Center. It's sort of to cap off your Center College career. They were doing that back then. It's traditions like that that make, help make Center College what it is. My father was named J.H. Doc Biles, and everybody called him Doc. And he came to Center oh, in about 1921 to teach physics. Well, Mary Ann Burke and I came to see the film, and I was sitting next to her. When she saw Doc in that old film, she just went, oh, there's my daddy. We think, we now know who some of these people actually were.
the film itself is nearly 100 years old. So that, that truly is uh, an astonishing find because it's footage we're not like to see again. There were no colleges for women, either co-educational or single sex, in the United States until 20 years after Center was chartered. People who had created Center were in favor of education for their daughters and for women in general. There were academies, and they were sort of high schools with a beginning of a classical curriculum, not quite colleges. They operated in Danville on Main Street or on Lexington Avenue. There were several of them. Um, the most famous person ever to teach at Center College, Lottie Moon, she taught at the Bell Academy, which was at the Baptist Church. Uh, it merged into the various Education for Women institutions, which eventually becomes the Kentucky College for Women. Well, Kentucky College for Women is actually founded in 1854 as the Henderson Female Institute. The Henderson Female Institute uh, was one of the early, fairly early ones, and that started in Danville in 1854. That eventually became Caldwell College and then KCW. During uh, the presidency of John C. Young, who was president 1830 to 1857, several of his daughters actually took classes at Center College and actually completed all the degree requirements. But they were female and so they weren't granted degrees. But that was an early step towards co-education. John C. Young was a Pennsylvanian. He went to Dickinson College and Princeton Seminary. And the college asked Princeton Seminary who would be good to be a college president. And the person we asked famously said, I know the guy and he is already among you. John C. Young was pastor in Lexington of the Presbyterian Church when he came to be president. In the meantime, relations with Caldwell College grew closer and closer and there was increasing cooperation between the schools and eventually Caldwell became KCW and uh, merged with Center in 1925. The campus itself was located across town uh, on East Main Street where Danville High School is now located. The dining hall was in East Hall, and behind that there was a, a separate building, which was the old gym building, and that's where we had a, a swimming pool and the bowling alley or a tin pin alley down in the basement. And there was a little gym there as well. I think it's a mistake to think of KCW and Center as separate entities since they have been merged for so many years, since 1930. We were very much at KCW a combined campus. We said in the catalog that they were coordinated but not co-educational. And that was treated as a virtue. That would be good for both, but particularly for women, to not actually be in the same place as men. We rode a bus to get to the center campus. The buses ran every hour to pick us up at the dorm and bring us to campus and to bring us back. Well, after breakfast, if you had an early class, you went out to West Hall and got on the, this yellow bus and they brought you all the way over to Old Main. In 1962, when President Spragans merged the two, uh, they built the North Dorms for women they built the earlier Cowan building, the octagonal Cowan, as the combined dining hall for both. And when that was done, the college and the city swapped buildings. I was present in a period of real transition. 
The move to the main center campus from the KCW dormitory was not, repeat not, a happy occasion for any of the women. Living in KCW was like living in one great, huge sorority house. The, the film shows us Kentucky College for Women, and the buildings look quite beautiful. It shows us a, a arch and walkway. We see students coming in out of the buildings, which and those are things I've never seen before. It shows us angles on buildings, and we don't have photographs of those that I know of. So all of that is really a, a kind of treasure. And I think of all of those buildings, only one survives and it is behind uh, part of the Danville High School and maybe one old building from that entire campus survives to this day. The film shows us the buildings in ways that we have not seen before. The C6HO is a, it's, it's just one football game way back before the NCAA and it may have caused the NCAA by the way uh, and, and yet it's a model. It, it's a model that we can do anything. That we're the mighty mouse of higher education and uh, good things happen from small things. They thought if we can be undefeated and we can beat some of the state universities, some of these universities that are also playing some of the schools in the east and we can compete on the same level, perhaps somebody like Harvard or Yale or Princeton may take a look. They sort of nationalized a sport that until that time had been so provincial. The East uh, really wanted to hold on to the mantle of being the, the center of, of power of college football. And the Southern schools really were not very well respected by the Eastern schools. And so uh, to have a school from the South, you know, knock off one of the Eastern powers uh, was sort of a, a blow to the prestige of the, of the East. So 1919, the center sprang upon the football world by first beating Indiana and then going over and beating Virginia by the same margin that Harvard had beaten Virginia, but Center played Virginia in Charlottesville and Harvard beat Virginia in Cambridge. So all of a sudden people are beginning to think what's going on down there in the little town of Danville. So to me the prominent story I think here is not so much the upset of Harvard in 1921, but the rise of this small little school basically out of nowhere uh, to national prominence in 1919. 1919 was the very first year that Center really played a major s schedule. And so their very first year as a, as a major power, they, could, they were considered for the national championship. The 1920 game obviously was a dream come true, the game uh, with Harvard, between Harvard and Center, for the Center boys. It's almost supernatural. I mean, how can a little school of 200 people with a football team that a couple of seasons before couldn't even put enough guys on the field to scrimmage, all of a sudden be going to the temple of football to uh, Harvard Stadium on Soldier's Field and play Harvard, but indeed they did. The first time when, uh, when Center went to, uh, uh, to Cambridge, uh, they lost by, I think the score was 31 to uh, 14, something like that. Uh, but but uh, basically the game was very competitive. Uh, for for more than a half, but Center only had 15, 16 players, and, and Harvard had uh, considerably more players, and they were bigger, and, and Center, I think, just finally wore down physically. But uh, they learned a lesson from that, and, and Bo McMillan and the rest of them were not at all convinced that Harvard was a better team than they were, and, and they wanted another chance uh, to prove what they could do. When Bo McMillan stood over in the lobby of Breck Hall, Picture this, picture any college quarterback doing this today who needed money. And Bo said, guys, I got, we got to have a team meeting here. I have been offered a five-year, $50,000 contract to play pro ball. You know I need the money. But I tell you what, I'm coming back next year, and I want to know how many of you guys will come back with me. Because you know what? We can beat Harvard. We can do it. Now, are you with me? Center purposefully played a very conservative game in 1921. They went in at the half extremely pleased that they had a 0-0 score. 
And so it, thinking that if they could just score once, they'll win the game. They thought they had the, the team to keep Harvard out of the end zone. So the second half began and center had the ball on the 32 yard line. Well, they came out the second half and for reasons I still don't quite understand, Harvard tries a quick kick real early in the, in the third quarter. I guess thinking they're gonna catch center by surprise, boot the ball way down the field and back them up. Instead, they'll get a short punt, they get a penalty on the play, and center takes over, if I remember correctly, around the 35, 38 yard line of Harvard, 45 seconds into the second half. And now center's got another trick play ready. So Bo had uh, the team line up, and he told Terry Snowday to go down and fake outright or hit outright, and if the Harvard secondary follows him, that's good. He'll take him take him out of the uh, play, the Harvard secondary. But it, and if they don't, he's, he'll pass to Snowday. It's a, it's an option play. They roll Bo McMillan out to the right, which at that time, in that age, if you rolled right, you went right. That was usually the end of the discussion. Instead, on this time, they were going to roll him right. He was going to stop, act like he was going to throw the ball down the field, and he was going to come back left on a design play. And center did it, played it exactly as they had practiced it so many times. All of a sudden, the center players started chopping down one after another, Harvard man, and Bo was streaking down, and he was basically in the clear, but there were two Harvard backs still chasing him. He shifted the ball to his left hand so he could side arm or stiff arm with his right hand. The uh, two Harvard backs, one overshot him, one missed him. Bo then t uh, turned it on. He was literally this close to the sideline. He went the final yards that both Harvard players hit him as he hit the goal line, but his forward motion carried him into the end zone. That was the only score of the game. To me, it's never been about the game. It is a way in which Center College defines itself as being a place that kind of hits above its weight, a, a place where remarkable things occur. But more importantly, it sends a signal to students that I think is much more powerful and important, which is anything is possible. In the middle of the 20th century, the first big issue was integration. Racial integration uh, was a priority of President Thomas Spragans, who became president of Center in 1957. In 1964, the first three African-American students enrolled as regular students. Sharon Gill Gaskins, Joyce Cross Marks, and Jim Davis became the first African-American students to graduate from Center College. Uh, when I came to Center, uh, I didn't know at the time that I was the only black male on campus. and. Um, also didn't know that there was just two uh, African-American females who were enrolling at the same time. I didn't realize we were the first ones who were enrolling. The atmosphere at Center was uh, pretty diverse. There was a, a, a very different um, uh, environment, if you will, depending on who you were interacting with. The interaction with um, many of the students was one of curiosity, perhaps, than, than anything else. And uh, like any environment, there will be people who will embrace that curiosity and who will uh, you know, embrace you as an individual and want to get to know you. There are others who were not nearly so willing to embrace. I arrived here in the fall of 1969. Center had an enrollment of roughly 715 students. Of the 715 students, there were 10 African-American students on campus, seven men, three women, the six of the seven men were athletes, so the athletic department was Center's enrollment vehicle to get African-American students on this campus. The men had uh, Max Cabinets, who was the dean of men, and Dr. Cabinets went out of his way to make certain that we were welcome on the Center campus, did things to, to make that environment very welcome. For the women on campus, there was a, a uh, dean of women who was on there. Uh, but her personality in terms of trying to create a build that type of environment uh, wasn't what Max Cabinets was as towards men. So we had a support network. Women didn't have that. If you really want to know about uh, life for African American females on this campus, you can need to talk to Zenobia Milton, but what we call, call it, talk to Zizi, and she will tell you what it was like. I came to Center College in 1966. I had no idea that there was a problem at Center College. 
there weren't a lot of African Americans at center at that time. It left me in a very, what I felt was a very hostile situation. We learned very quickly that in Danville, an African American couldn't get his hair cut in any of the shops. In fact, there was a, one shop owned by an African American with all African American barbers who wouldn't cut black people's hair during the course of the day. There was Martin Luther King and there were the pictures on television of people that looked like me and there was the water hoses and there were the dogs. You have to remember when I came in 1969 was at the height of the Vietnam War and the protests. So the fall of 69 and the spring of 1970 on this campus, as on all college campuses, was an interesting time because there were big anti-war movements and students were active. They were involved in getting, doing things. And so, you know, my small part in terms of uh, being an activist was, you know, getting engaged in the litigation regarding the, the Danville barbershops. We decided, uh, several of us, uh, that we were gonna challenge them not cutting African Americans' hair. It, it was a difficult time, you see. Integrating anything during that period of time was hard. It was hard on those that came first. When I was at center, it was hell. I dealt with having been called the N-word and not retaliating. There were more of them than there were of me. Angry, yes. Hateful, yes. Bitter, yes. But I was going to get my degree from Center College. A lawsuit was filed in which there were three plaintiffs, Ollie Taylor, Tommy Smith, and Raymond Burse. We sued the barbershops and we eventually won that suit. And I take great pride in saying we desegregated all of the barbershops in the Eastern District of Kentucky. You are learning because you are seeing different people, different ideas, different backgrounds, and they're all able to come together, learning how not to isolate people, learning how that people may not live like you live, they might not think like you think, they might not even dress like you dress, but they're people and they have something to offer. It has certainly changed since we were here. We see all kinds of races of students and ethnicities, and it's a wonderful thing. Different colors from different places are so marvelous when you begin to really have conversation with them. I see all these different people. I never thought that this place would ever allow all these different people to come and learn. So Center, yes, Center is still a work in progress. They still must open up their doors, not the physical doors, but the doors of their mind. The Norton Center was built in 1973, and because of its unique architecture, which through the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, it really has made an incredible impact on the college itself. Uh, the, the Norton Center for the Arts uh, should not be here at Center College. This, uh, this was a very small institution at the time that a small group of people, uh, one, one woman in particular, Jane Norton, and several others uh, who can be called off by name, uh, decided that, that their college here in Central Kentucky at an institution at the time was about 700 students should have a performing arts center that would rival a, an arts center on any campus in America and in fact uh, be comparable to what is, is, is still in New York and they built it over here on the corner. It was a daring move. Uh, Tom Spragans was the president at the time and I'm sure he was taking some bullets 
for doing such a thing. And yet it remains now in 2018 uh, a remarkable place uh, that serves the region uh, in important ways and most importantly provides a place for Center College and its students in particular to go and see and experience art at the highest level. It actually was originally built for Arizona State University and for whatever reason they chose not to use the floor plan and the architectural drawings so we ended up picking it up. Center College purchased those drawings and built that facility here. So the color scheme and the landscape of it is definitely southwestern, which again doesn't fit in the Georgian architecture and the southern architecture that we have at Center College, which I find very cool. Another component of this is there, there are virtually no right angles in the building, especially in the performance spaces. There are certainly right angles in the doorways and the stairs, but when you walk into Newland Hall or Whistler Theater, if you take a look around, you won't see a right angle. And the reason for that is the acoustics. The acoustics are shot throughout from the stage, and if you have a 90 degree angle, they get caught in there and will get stuck. Well, when you don't have 90 degree angles, the acoustics just keep going and allow the fullest sound. Steve has a real strong feeling about integrating uh, the, the Norton Center and its, and its uh, schedule into the academic life, into the learning life of our students, and I think that's a powerfully good thing. The college was ready for that. That, that I think, is different than some of his predecessors, that he wants the experience based around high-level, high-quality performance in the Norton Center to have an educational impact in the lives of the students who are here. So that, that's a, that matters to him, and because it matters to him, it manifests itself in what goes on over there and, and the impact it has in students' lives being in the class of 1973, which was the first graduating class that graduated in the Norton Center. So I was, it was being built while I, we were here, and they finished it in enough time for us to have our commencement exercises in the Norton Center. Uh, it's, it's an outstanding place in terms of being able to do things, but I, you know, I relish the, the, uh, the opportunity to have graduated in the Norton Center and then now come back and look at big name entertainment. From Ella Fitzgerald and Ray Charles and the Vienna Philharmonic to the New York Philharmonic to um, Dolly Parton twice, Kenny Rogers on his final tour, uh, popular artists like Cool and the Gang and ZZ Top and Foreigner. I have attended many concerts and plays and so forth at the, at the Norton Center. It's a very impressive building, but I, I think it's wonderful that we have this, that resource and that the community does. One of the icons that we have had at the Norton Center is Willie Nelson, and he is a character. He, when he came, uh, people didn't know what to expect, and my, my understanding through stories was that he invited people onto his tour bus, and what happens on the tour bus stays on the tour bus. This is Willie Nelson. We did have a big time tonight at the Norton Center, and we know you will too when you come out for the upcoming season. Good. You ever think about being a preacher? So keep that oh, I don't pay enough. <laughs> <laughs> he was still up there already in years, so to perform that long for, for three hours nonstop is really remarkable. And it's just another way of showing the breadth of the artistry that we bring to the Norton Center. Is it fine art? For some it will be, but popular? Definitely for, for just about everybody. Although there is a great emphasis on the Norton Center and the amazing shows and artists that we've been able to bring to the Norton Center, I think our students also provide a lot of great shows and a lot of great entertainment in Wizzager Theater um, inside of, of Newland Hall. I feel like the Norton Center has given students the opportunity to express themselves um, in many ways um, and to just, you know, have a great evening to be entertained and to be welcomed um, uh, on campus. The Norton Center is a completely crazy thing for a college like Center to have. Um, only when I was a student in the late 80s, early 90s, I thought every college had that. It, it's definitely a beautiful looking building. Uh, you know, I think what, what it is, is, it's able to do is the way it's built, 
the accommodations in terms of seating, you're able to, you know, there are really no real bad seats in, in the place. And to have a fine art center of that caliber on a campus like Center is, is, is not imaginable. Clearly, uh, the Norton Center for the Arts is, is sort of the apex of what we do around here with regard to performance. And it is, it is uh, beyond remarkable that a college of our size in, in this region of the country would have a facility of that type and quality and would have a record for bringing performers in uh, that are just world-class kind of people. And I, I, I like very much uh, that we're able to do that for a region. Uh, I like it particularly well because our students are valuably served by having a chance to brush up against greatness and great performance and great performers. And I, help that, I think that helps to shape their trajectory going forward. So I'm, I'm a big believer in that kind of performance, being a part of a first-rate college experience. And we do that here uh, in phenomenal ways. Study abroad at Center has, has become a defining element of the undergraduate experience. It just broadens their horizons. It gives them a view of what's possible in a way that reading a book or listening to a lecture just doesn't do. It's experiential learning of the most intense and, and uh, energizing sense. When Rich Morrow came in, his ambition was really to raise the academic standard of the college. He's the one who called us the mighty mouse, right? The, uh, the best college under a thousand in the country. That was his ambition. And we were in the 750s or 800s then. When after a decade of his leadership, when Mike Adams came in, he wanted to do something that would put Center on the map as a distinctive kind of college. And what he hit on was study abroad. In his inaugural address, he said, uh, you know, our students are, can compete with anybody, but we need to get them abroad. We're in the middle of a small state, we're a small school, uh, far from the oceans in other countries, and we need to get them abroad. So he started first the London program in 1990, and then Strasbourg in 91, then we kept adding until now we have like 13 semester programs. Plus our center term programs have proliferated. Uh, right now in January 2017 we have 243 students and faculty all over the globe in seven different time zones. We, we now, we own study abroad. We are the best at that. We're Harvard in terms of study abroad. Uh, they're not us, we're, we're them. And, and uh, they, would, they would wish to be as good as we are in, in study abroad and the impact it has in students' lives. Uh, that's been absolutely intentional. It was our plan from the time I arrived to become a place that is known for that. I think study abroad does allow students to uh, get away and experience something different. But what really happens is it's as if they live in one place. We all live in a place and a culture and we see it through the eyes of that culture and think of it as we see it in two dimension. When you go and you become immersed and you do that, particularly in a semester program abroad, immersed in a different culture, it's like suddenly uh, you don't obliterate where you come from. You can go home again, but you go home again with a different vision. It's like suddenly you have 3D because you have something to compare it with. The opportunity we provide to students, all students, regardless of their ability to pay, in some cases even their level of interest, the encouragement is, the expectation is that a student will study abroad at least once uh, and now increasingly more than once. And because we are preparing students as global citizens, because that's the world in which our young graduates will live and operate. One parent once asked me, well, won't my child be less American when she comes back because she's lived in China for four months? And I said, no, actually, she'll be much more American because she'll see in a different way, more clearly, you have a different perspective. And that brings about, I think, an incredible academic and intellectual uh, growth, but also a personal growth. We gotta prepare young people who can cross over culture, cross over language, cross over religion, cross over race, and be comfortable to be a citizen leader in whatever country they might find themselves on that particular morning.
One thing that happens abroad is that you're taken out of your primary groups, your comfort zones, whether that's a fraternity, a sorority, a sports team, uh, anything on campus. You know, you, you have certain primary groups and you have new friends that you, you probably wouldn't ever have gotten to know. Study abroad isn't vacationing abroad. It's immersing yourself in a culture. It's immersing yourself in experiences that when you come back from that, you've grown as a person, right? My hope as Chief Diversity Officer is that over your four years here as a student and your career here, if you're a, a professional, a faculty member, or a staff person, that you will grow as well. So how do we grow? By being around other people, by sharing parts of our narrative of our lives and listening to, understanding, um, appreciating the experiences of other people as well. From historic Danville, Kentucky, good evening, and welcome to this year's only vice presidential debate sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. The debates uh, really brought, were very intentional to bring both national and international attention to Center College. Um, so it, it was a PR ploy of monumental proportions. I have friends around the world, uh, many of whom know that I went to Center. And when you know, the debate was going on, I would get calls or texts. Like, hey, you know this is happening on your campus? And I'm like, yes, yes, I do know. And to talk to other people about, wow, like. I attended an institution that was able to host two vice presidential debates in the span of, of, of 12 years. Um, I felt, definitely felt very proud. I was struck by how polished a performance it was. And other, from the college's perspective, it was almost seamless. It was remarkable how well-coordinated people being moved into Newland Hall for the actual debate. The surrounding community, the security was very much in place, but on the other hand, it did not appear to be horribly intrusive to those who were not going to be on the inside of the gates, as it were. I think it's, it's pretty clear that a school of center size being able to host vice presidential debate caught a great deal of attention. There's virtually no other school of our size that can say that they've brought in uh, vice presidential or even presidential debate. For an event like the vice presidential debate, it has a, a chance to be a lot more impactful at a school like Center because we're so small and because students are so involved in volunteering with everything that goes on here. from the student side of it to the, to the staff and faculty. I just remember watching the transformation of, of the campus, the physical transformation of the campus, but the energy was amazing. I think we were all very proud that we were chosen again to host a vice presidential debate. Um, but I also thought for me as a, as a center alum at the time, it was a very proud moment. And I can report as it relates to performance that it worked in every way we could have imagined. We, in 2000, arguably set the standard by which other debates are still judged. I think it really did put center on the international stage, probably attracted some folks to this campus that might otherwise have been utterly unaware of it. How are the students there responding to all of that? Well, you know, we just left a wonderful event where we did our ticket, uh, student ticket lottery. We had 500 students sign up uh, for the ticket lottery, and we just picked 100 names. So 100 of our students are guaranteed to be in the debate hall to watch the debate. You know, this is a, just a hugely educational opportunity for our students. They study politics in the classroom. They're very engaged, but they're actually getting to see the political process uh, with a front row seat. And I love my friend here. I have, I'm not allowed to show letters, but go on our website. He sent me two letters saying, by the way, 
can you send me some stimulus money for companies here in the state of Wisconsin? We sent millions of dollars. You know why he said You did he ask for stimulus money. Sure he correct? did. By the way, On he, two he occasions, we, had, we, we advocated for constituents who were applying for grants. You could almost cut the tension in the place. Just persons, not unlike myself, having a very difficult time not laughing at appropriate moments. Hey, that famous question that Ronald Reagan asked, are you better off today than you were eight years ago, most people would say yes. And I'm pleased to say, see Dick from the newspapers, that you're better off than you were eight years ago, too. I mean, most of it, uh, <laughs> and I, I can tell you, Joe, that the government had absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> or booing at appropriate moments. With all due respect, that's a bunch of malarkey. And why fact, is that so? Because not a single thing he said is accurate. And we took some risk, and we put ourselves out there as a performer as a college and our people came through, our students came through, everyone uh, delivered. And I don't know why, when they asked to have a presidential debate, they didn't allow us to do that. Secretary Cheney, Senator Lieberman, your debate now joins American political history. We thank you. Well, you hear the appreciation here, and our thanks also to Center College, the community of Danville, and of course, the Bluegrass State, Kentucky. In terms of how diversity benefits the campus, it's critical. If we want to offer an education that empowers students to be leaders, we've got to teach them how to bridge across differences in background, ethnically and racially, but also socioeconomically. Institutional culture is a really hard thing to change. Posse has changed the culture of Center College. And the Posse offered us an opportunity to do that, to bring students um, who are diverse in many ways. The Center was looking for a way to get some momentum towards increasing diversity and making Center uh, a place that was more ready to welcome students from a variety of different backgrounds. Posse to me means family. Not only family as in your own posse, which is like a group of 10, but a network of family. So you have 40 family members that you know you can count on, you know that you can go to for support if you need to. The word posse to me means uh, relationship. I have gotten to build so many relationships with the people in my posse and in the posse years before and after me. It's a program that's built to teach students to think in new ways about diversity and building bridges between different groups of people. It was very early in my administration. Debbie Beal was a personal friend of mine at the time. And my, my sense was that Center needed to do something that was dramatic, something that was visible. Greg Cherry, uh, who I got to know when he was a, a mere 18-year-old. He made a decision to come out here and be a pioneer as one of the early Posse students, to be highly successful here as a student, and then to stick around and help the college become stronger and better and faster. My name is Gregory Cherry, and I am the current director of Community Service and of Honor Program. I spent four years here as a scholar, and then I graduated in 2011, and then I began working in the admissions office and then I started recruiting Posse Scholars in my time there as well. I did come with the second class of Posse Scholars here. When we came to campus, it was a very, it was, it was a culture shock. I went from being the majority to quickly being the only person of color in a classroom. And, and it wasn't always bad. I found myself isolated and really hanging out with my Posse. When Debbie Bill came to um, Center in, in spring of 16 to be our commencement speaker, I actually had a lot of interactions with her, and I thought her, her remarks were, were spot on. I think the legacy that we left has really bridged this gap between our current students of color and our, and our alum. An important facet of the way that the Posse program works is that uh, each cohort gets a faculty or staff mentor. Andrea Abrams is a really good example of a fine posse mentor. 
My Posse mentor is Professor Andrea Abrams, and she is an amazing woman. Professor Andrea Abrams is a great mentor. Um, I, I'm glad I have her, and, and I'm glad my posse mates have her as well. Coming down to Kentucky wasn't easy, but to have a mentor who, who's as strong, um, independent, and intelligent as Andrea is, um, is just a wonderful thing to have. For becoming a posse mentor, I did have a sense of some of the struggles and the issues that posse students had. The challenge of dealing with them as a group has been a challenge. But it's also been very gratifying to see how a posse group actually works, the way that they they bond with each other, the way that they have each other's backs on things. Coming from Boston, where there's a lot more racial and ethnic diversity, this can be a bit of a adjustment period. And I think one of the ways I'm, I can be helpful is being a resource of how you do that and what that feels like and validating feelings and um, giving as good advice as I can on that. I don't think that Center's Posse program would be what it is without Bob Nesmith. Bob Nesmith is a, a great success story of a Center College graduate uh, who has now become a leader, not, not just here at Center College, but in his field. Posse is a academic leadership scholarship for undergrad. It's very hard being a first generation college student, being a black student in classes where other people don't look like you, professors don't look like you, people don't share the same experiences as you. But nonetheless, I wouldn't have changed my decision to come to center because I've met some amazing people that actually do understand me and that do appreciate my identity. Last fall we went up and played University of Kentucky, one of the premier basketball programs in America. The, the reason those things matter, it's really not about athletics at all for me, is I, I like it when our students uh, whether historically or now current, have a chance to compete at a high level. Playing in Rupp Arena against Kentucky Wildcats, I mean, that, that's different than any experience we've ever had. So, hey, we want to come in here. We want to have the time of our life. We want to represent Center College in the way that it deserves. And uh, at the same time, we're going to play with a smile on our face. To be a Kentucky fan and to, to play against Kentucky and also to be a coach and going against a Naismith Hall of Famer and John Calipari, I mean, these are experiences. I mean, you know, I guess the word, if there is a word, it would be surreal. Coach Bates has treated us like every other game. Uh, we've prepared, we've done, done a scouting report for him. Uh, obviously, we practiced a few more uh, defensive uh, plays against alley oops, but besides that, everything else is normal. Tonight at Rough Arena, it's the Kentucky Wildcats, an in state foe for Division III Center College. Let's get your minds right, all right, get yourselves ready to play. You got about 13 minutes to go get warmed up. When you run out on the floor, run out with a smile on your face right there, okay? All right, here we go. Here we go, Black. Hey, I want you guys to enjoy this, all right? We've talked about that, and a big part of that is going to be play the right way, all right? You guys know how to play the right way. Let's bring it, all right? On three. One, two, three. Play hard. Just being able to see that first ball go through the basket just meant a whole lot. Even if it was just warm up to nobody would guard you, it still meant a lot of confidence-wise to help me just relax out there. Everyone was really excited just to, to, to be there and be able to play against, you know, guys we watch on TV and guys we've, we'd seen, you know, get recruited by Coach Cal. Um, you know, we were all just super excited and there was, there was just a lot of energy. Early in the game, it was just a whole lot of just dribble action. And then I had the ball and just a whole lot opened up for me. We had a lot of shooters on the floor, so that helped out a whole lot when it comes to driving lanes. And uh, it was just, I started to drive left and just a whole lot of space opened up. And um, when I got in the lane, I kind of just, I got stuck for a little bit and had to a little double clutch it. And then I finally got up there, but then like later I looked and I saw about a nine foot wingspan it looked like just jump out of nowhere and almost try to block it and I mean I'm just happy it went in and be able to score the first point but uh, it was just it was just a really really great experience to be able to do that for the guys. Kisses it off the window and center is on the board. We wanted to have our mind right because we didn't know what we were getting ready to go into. There's going to be 20,000 people in the arena and a couple hundred thousand on SEC Network. And let's have a lot of people when this game is over say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to follow center basketball. All-time series, 46 meetings between these two teams, but they were all played between 1906 and 1929. And you see there in 1910, long time ago, center handed Kentucky its largest Woo! loss in school history a 70 point win this was the 1909 team but it was this team the 1910 team that beat the cats by 70. wow they beat them by 70 huh yeah. 19, back at the 
How many points were scored in the game? Wow. Who was coaching that team? <laughs> I, I thought it was fun. Um, I, I don't know how much notoriety uh, it gave us or how much attention it attracted, but I did think it was enormous fun. This is just outright hustling. How about the between the legs pass and a finish down low for Jacob Spitzer. That, that run we made, uh, we got within six points. That was a that was a huge moment for us. Yeah, we made it. That was, that was an awesome run, and I was on the bench at that point. But I, it was, you could just really feel the energy in the building, all of our fans. From the corner for Tucker Sign. All of a sudden, a six-point game here in Lexington, Kentucky, leading it. Make sure to ask Jared Griffin about catching the ball probably about 45 feet from the basket. He had a teammate on one side, and then you see 6'9", Kevin Knox, right there about the top of the key. At one point in the second half, there's a loose ball, and it just went right in front of me, and I picked it up, and I realized that it was going to be uh, Kevin Knox who guarded me, and it was just me and him. And uh, I, He's definitely way bigger than me, but I just kind of went left and took it to the basket, and it went in. I think a lot of people in the arena probably thought he was going to throw it up in the stands, but... It went in, so it's a pretty exciting moment. I had, I had a whole lot of faith in trusting Jarrett. Played with him for a long time. Strong drive by Jared Griffin. Zach Schmucker is just kind of the epitome of energy and happiness out there on the court. Um, he's really always playing with a smile on his face, and there's no better example of when he hit the three against Kentucky. That was obviously like a big dream of mine is to play in a rep arena, let him hit, hit a big shot like that. Uh, yeah, that was that was awesome, especially against UK. You know, I saw uh, Diallo coming to close out on me, and I still knew I was gonna, it was going to go in. Going forward, your your life is never quite the same. The idea of, of accepting challenge and, and 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 going with it is is somehow from that point forward, it's normal. It's okay. I I, I come to believe that there's not any challenge that I'm not capable of taking on. That doesn't mean you're always victorious. It doesn't mean you you even win in a literal sense, but the, what happens to you as a person, as a performer, is forever changed because you've gone against, in a particular field, sort of the best that there is. I like it when that happens. What a night for center basketball. What a night for center college. In the dictionary, nirvana is a, a, a state of perfect happiness, and that's, uh, that's me right now. Yep, the competition was pretty high tonight, and I think we uh, rose to the challenge. Um, so we're just thankful for uh, Kentucky and having us here, and what better way to play in, in Rupp Arena. This is a great opportunity to play against one of the best programs in college basketball, and uh, we're really excited to do this, and obviously length, athleticism uh, really got to us in the end, but we thought that we got better, and we hope that we helped them get better as a team too. I was really excited to have my ticket and get to watch the, the, the game, and it was just amazing to be able to watch our students, our team, play against a team that has won uh, the NCAA tournaments, you know, and, and it just is uplifting. Well, I took great delight in us going up and playing the University of Kentucky in an exhibition game. Um, our, our guys never backed down. They never felt overwhelmed or intimidated by it all. They went out and played hard. But afterwards, uh, we had had a chance uh, to compete. We'd had a chance to perform. President Rausch came in after a successful tenure by Mike Adams, who instituted especially the study abroad. Um, we had not had many changes in the physical plant in uh, his time, in, Professor, in President Adams' time. And there were some things that needed some improvement. The college needed to re remake itself. When I got here in the summer of 1998, there were a lot of our spaces that were pretty tired. John Roush did not primarily want to be a brick and mortar president, as he said. Uh, his emphasis was really on the academic and on the personal side of personal education. But there were buildings that needed to be built. We needed to look like the institution that we already were and that we aspired to be. I can tell you as a faculty member who came here in 1987, the classrooms, the library, 
all of the facilities are just so much better than they used to be, and I thought they were pretty good when I got here. You can think about President Rausch's tenure here at Center College um, as an expansion of the facilities of the college. Uh, we have a massive uh, South Fields project. We're expanding some of the athletic uh, uh, facilities. We, under his tenure, have increased um, our student enrollment. We have increased the facilities in terms of uh, buildings on campus. The first thing that needed to be done uh, was a uh, change in Cowan. The college decided, even though the building wasn't falling down, to tear it down and redesign it and make a real campus center. And I think that has worked. And that then launched the sequence of improvements of the library, of the gym, and then uh, dormitory improvements and enhancements to uh, accommodate the expanded student body. When I arrived in 1987, there were approximately 900 students at Center. Now we're 1,500 students. We could not have handled 1,500, 1,400 students uh, with the facilities we had then. Gosh, the, the student number counts and, and the enrollment that we now observe, uh, I couldn't have guessed that we'd be there, though it was not unplanned. Uh, in my entire presidency, I've talked often about what it is to be a place of measured and modest growth. And so when I got here in, in the summer and fall of, of uh, 1998, we were about 1,020 students. We're now 1,430 students in fall of, of 16. Uh, that, that has made us a stronger place. I would argue it's made us a more intentional place, a more personal place. The quality of experience that our students have in the residence halls, in the dining hall, in the classrooms, in the laboratories, and all the rest is superior to what it was when we were 40% smaller. During the economic downturn in 2007 and 8, I was really struck by the leadership and the strength uh, that President Jean Rausch and the trustees displayed during that really extraordinary time when the stock market collapsed. President Rausch had come here with the intentions of balancing the budget of Center College and putting us on a very steady and solid grounding. Center College has done nothing but move from strength to strength since, since that time. I'd had several occasions before the Center College presidency to take jobs in, as president. Uh, didn't think the place was right, didn't think the time was right, and didn't do it. What brought me here was I thought a chance to make a difference for good in the life of an institution that was already strong. I, I didn't think I would be so effective going to a place that, that wasn't poised to do some remarkable things. And in 1998, I judged that Center College was such a place. When we think about expansion in a community, it's not limited to just the number of people here, the number of buildings or, or edifices on the campus. Um, there's an expansion that is um, sometimes harder to see because it's not necessarily physically manifested in that kind of way. We've expanded our curriculum in some kinds of ways. We've brought in new faculty with new ideas, new people with new ideas. We've expanded the vision of who we are. We are a place that says great teaching is prized. Our focus is on the undergraduate programs in the arts and sciences, and we value scholarship, and we value service, but we value great teaching above all else. A student athlete who comes here can also be in a fraternity, will be expected to study abroad, have an internship, work on campus, um, be, be involved in student life, maybe be a resident advisor or assistant. It's not one thing, it's any number of things, and I think that separates us, even from some of our competition. Our students arrive expecting to be involved, and they're allowed to be involved. Center College has been able to remain, even as we've grown, exceedingly personal almost at the level of being intimate. But we support each other. Uh, we're generous and kind with each other. Uh, everybody matters. And I hope that 10 years, 20 years, 50 years from now, Center College will be distinctive in the ways that I've described, but hasn't particularly lost that sense of what it is to be a place where people matter. Everybody matters. William Butler Yeats famously wrote, things fall apart the center cannot hold, and he spelled it the correct way, C-E-N-T-R-E, cannot hold. 
it does hold, it has held for almost 200 years. And it's given a purpose to many lives and many people. You ought to ask them what it means. My life without Center College, I, I, can't, even, I can't even imagine it. Center's where the world comes to me. Center is my ticket to see the world. Center is now. Center is the key to my future. Center is dope. All day, every day. I don't know exactly what Center means to me yet, uh, but so far I'm having the time of my life figuring it out. Center is me. And me. And me. And me. And me. And me. And me. I wish nothing but the best for the college is continued success in terms of educating young men, young women, and sending the center of people out to in fact help save the world and to advance the frontiers for social justice and for all the things which Center stands for. When I was president of the Alumni Association, I got to um, MC, if you will, a couple of events. And I always took that opportunity to say to the persons who were assembled, welcome home. And so I, I treasure the opportunity to say to this institution that has meant so much to me not welcome home to my fellow students and alumni, but happy birthday, Center, and I am praying for another 200. 200 years is a lot of years. Um, eight generations, if you will. And on this occasion, I, in my own behalf, and Susie's as well, I, I wanna wish Center College a happy birthday. Um, you've done well. Uh, you've fought a good fight and uh, the opportunity to continue that fight, to do good, make a difference in student lives uh, continues. And um, I look forward to that next 100th year celebration and maybe even the one after that. Um, won't be here for those, um, but I'll be thinking about you. Happy birthday.